Hello, I hope you're all enjoying your meal. It is now for me a great pleasure to introduce this next panel on the theme Women in the MENA region towards a new social contract. But first, I also I want to thank Nada uh, for her support and the ILO office for Arab states for making this debate possible. Thank you, Nada. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We um, meet uh, today almost two years uh, since that first spark, literally, of the Arab uprisings that started in Tunisia. Um, much has taken place since then, and the dramatic changes that swept through and continue to create many, many uncertainties in the Arab states region are a very important reminder of what we need to do in terms of finding a new development model for the region. One that is about inclusion, about sustainability, and principles that are firmly rooted in social justice. We believe that the Arab Spring has unleashed popular determination to shed decades-long legacy of skewed economic growth. We had entrenched patterns of exclusion and inequality the notion of a very false trade-off between political and socio-economic rights, and we believe they need to go hand in hand, along with, of course, a crisis of governance and accountability. Arab citizens, no longer subjects now, are calling for a new social contract, and this would be impossible without the full participation of women and other excluded groups with fairness and equity. There have been many gains across the board, but the position of Arab women today remains fragile, I don't want to say precarious, and their future uncertain. We have much to learn, and it's been great to listen to the past day of exchange um, in order to safeguard some of the achievements and to continue to push the envelope. Um, just before we came here in the plenary, someone said no more business as usual. Well, certainly in my region, there is no more business as usual. Um, but we also heard yesterday about the importance of innovation and critical mass, of times of crisis as opportunity, and of change that comes about through the action of a daring few. And I'm very pleased that here with me today are three such daring women from Egypt, from Jordan, and from Saudi Arabia, who are working on the ground to promote the new social and economic engagement that should take place now in their societies and beyond. I will introduce them briefly and ask them to make some opening remarks. I will ask them, and we have agreed that they speak for five or six minutes in order to leave some room for the exchange that we have benefited from so much over the last period. I will start with Lina at the end from Jordan. Uh, Lina started in agriculture and nutrition in Jordan, studied Greek somehow in Athens, and went on then to her own chocolate business. She is going to talk more about that journey but she is now a passionate advocate of women's entrepreneurship and a great ambassador for that set of causes. Muna, on my left, works in philanthropy and social responsibility, was selected as a young global reader by the World Economic Forum, and is now today an influential Saudi media personality who has transcended borders, I think, is instantly recognized across the Arab world um, for her work, not just in the media. She is now using her role to venture into issues of youth employment, particularly the critical issue of young women and the workplace. Uh, Rahma in the middle from Egypt, a veteran lawyer and human rights activist in Egypt, part of the new independent labor movement. And this is one of the many shocks uh, that are taking place across the Arab world. Rahma has been organizing campaigns, especially to remove the legal restrictions imposed on the right to organize uh, in Egypt, but is very familiar with the Arab scene. She has led teams to monitor violations of human and labor rights, and she has supported workers, men and women, in local communities, marginalized and vulnerable, to obtain their legal rights through developing their capacity and providing legal assistance. I had to ask Rahma to take care not to be arrested last week in front of the presidential palace um, so that we should bring her here. 
So I'm particularly happy that she can join us today. And I will start with Rahma. Obviously, I'm, I'm not going to recite the numbers because this is an expert uh, group, but the decent work deficit of the Arab region is reflected in one of the, no, the single lowest rate, labor force participation rate for women uh, in the Arab world. Official figures say one out of four Arab women are working. Um, and if you're a young woman, that's a double whammy. Um, and yet we saw women workers very active during the uprisings. Uh, they mobilized, they organized, they reached out to the more vulnerable groups, even among them, and they hi highlighted the need for social dialogue to promote their own engagement. So Rahma, what is the new social contract for women? And what do women workers need more than ever today? Um, the challenges in your opinion. Okay. okay. I think, of course, we are talking about a um, mountain of uh, a challenge that we are facing now in the Arab region and in Egypt, as example. Um, but firstly, I, I cannot but uh, to raise to the international community and the uh, special government, uh, U.S. government and European government, that um, and um, sometimes we feel that they keen, the international community keen with the stability in this region more than rights. Uh, and therefore, um, we are suffering sometimes, especially now, from feeling that even the uh, new Islamic authorities are supported by some uh, international governments uh, as um, the um, the organized power uh, that can um, uh, guarantee stability in this region. Um, I have to say that stability in this region and stability in Egypt cannot be realized without social dialogue. Um, lack of social dialogue and lack of um, uh, which based on lack of right to freedom of expression and right to freedom of association uh, for uh, a long time for um, uh, and um, totalism thinking um, and uh, absence of um, uh, culture of dialogue, especially social dialogue, um, lead to instability, unbalance and in uh, this those society that ended to uh, revolutions. Uh, but the problem that we are uh, now are facing the same thinking, the same uh, lack of right and, um, to freedom of expression and to freedom of organization. And the women especially are suffering from uh, ignoring, denying their rights, and although the Egyptian, the Egyptian, yeah, for example, I, I am sorry because I have to come to Egypt every, uh, coming from Egypt, coming from demonstration that were in streets now, and that the Egyptian women are for the second time have to go to the streets, calling for the rights, saying that um, women voice. Um, is not a taboo, is not a shameful thing. Uh, women voice is um, the revolution voice. This is their slogan that they are raising now in the streets. Again, the new authority that uh, denial women rights. I have to say that, for example, now the new constitution in Egypt, uh, which uh, supposed to be a new social contract, social uh, uh, in Egypt, ignore the um, for the first time, ignoring uh, the the uh, to um, uh, to uh, uh, prove uh, the right of that the women and men are uh, equal uh, as a, a equal citizen concerning rights, their rights. And 
uh, and commitment also. And within the founder uh, assembly in Egypt, when they were discussing the issue, this, this issue, they began to discuss this. Uh, it, it was contradiction between um, Muslim brothers and their collaborators and the other civil trends. And then they say, um, we should put the, the uh, 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 equality between women and men, but within uh, um, the uh, Sharia um, uh, concepts. And the, while the other trends saying that we refuse to say this, what it means, that they say, okay, as it is some contradiction, we should cancel this article. For they cancel the article as a whole. For the, the, um, then it's no article in the constitution um, um, confirm the equality between women and um, even the, the, it's, uh, the rights of most of the um, um, most of the um, vulnerable uh, groups. Uh, uh, for the uh, it's the the first time in I think maybe in uh, in Egyptian constitution and uh, maybe in the world that it's an article within the constitution um, um, that says the forced labor is allowed by the law according but even but by the law yeah uh, it's the first the first time of course as child labor is allowed. It's, it's uh, crazy that the concepts of rights, concepts of that forced labor cannot be accepted in the 21st century. They cannot understand the, 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 um, this monologue. Yeah. Anyway, uh, now we are facing, of course, a lot of challenge. Um, I, I didn't, um, I, I cannot expect what what how can we uh, uh, um, uh, facing uh, accurately such a challenge but i am sure that we have opportunities we have opportunities because um women in egypt uh, yeah, uh, in spite of um that may be the official statistics um that m women in egypt cannot come back to home cannot come back to home because 40 percentage of the Egyptian workers are economically responsible for their families although it is not um, uh, 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 yeah, it's not according to the official statistics um, therefore women and therefore you can understand why the popular people it's not true that the popular people are sympathy now with the Islamic authorities. They are against because they are afraid that their mentality that um, um, affected um, negatively on the for the the um, women access to the labor market, women access to resources, and uh, and therefore they they have we we believe that. Um, many categories in the Egyptian society and women especially are um, protesting hardly uh, in defense of their rights. And on the other hand, um, I think that what had happened within the um, last two uh, years after the revolution, that although of course the, you know, the revolution, when the Egyptian people are going to the street, they were this lack of organization. Of course, it was, but they, and lack, of course, of, of their um, their um, opportunities to have access to their resources and to social dialogue with the other social parts. But what had happened within this year is that everything is begin to be discussed that the Egyptian workers are uh, and the Egyptian popular categories and the women are now learning um, how they can um, organize dialogue, social dialogue between the front parts. Uh, for the first time in Egypt, it's an open dialogue concerning the should we, um, uh, yeah, um, what's our um, 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 
what the yeah, concepts of social dialogue, concepts of social contract, that uh, different categories should have the opportunity to um, uh, and access to a political um, uh, gov governance, rational governance, um, and other uh, uh, democratic uh, concepts. On the, um, I know that Nada, you want me to, to finish, but <laughs> what I want to say also that it's I also I cannot but to rest with the international community there. The problem is the problem that to look at democracy as democracy is election. Democracy is not election. Democracy is human rights. Democracy is the rights of the people themselves to organize themselves, right to freedom of expression. And then if then they can choose and their representative for the, 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 the bad concept of that. But why not Muslim brothers? Sometimes we are facing with this by some uh, international parts that you elected. What can we do to you? No, the issue is not it. They are they elected. It means that they became our representative. They are, should be in the government, and we should come back to our home without even and say one word. It, it's not a democracy. Democra how democracy? How to 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 talk about to uh, democracy without uh, human rights? Basic human rights. Basic women rights. Basic uh, rights of the minority. We in Egypt are a huge minority, Coptic minority. How can you just dis discuss the issue of democracy as just election of parliament and government? It's not a democracy, of course. Recently, I think yes, social dialogue because this is the the, the issue uh, uh, in our workshop now it's uh, of course social dialogue again is very important but social dialogue very very important but social dialogue cannot be realized without right to freedom of association because social organized social parts who can organize social dialogue and without right to freedom of um, uh, association and right to freedom of expression no way to develop our social dialogue Thank you, Ahma. Uh, Lina, um, this is a very important reminder about the critical struggle going on at the moment in the Arab world in terms of preserving rights during a transition, which we hope will be a transition to democracy. It will take a few years, clearly, but this is a flavor of what we are going to face moving forward. Uh, Lina, we heard some ideas yesterday about the challenge of increasingly educated young women and the workplace. Um, clearly, it's not skills that are the primary barrier to economic participation or to leadership or decision-making positions, but the barriers persist. As an entrepreneur, a successful employer yourself, give us a sense how it looks from your perspective and what would be some key priorities moving forward. Actually, uh, when I started my business in 1992, I started in the chocolate manufacturing where it was a, a, a male-dominated uh, area. And uh, the, the main reason that I wanted to start a chocolate factory was my passion to chocolate. My pa I was chocoholic. <laughs> so my, my aim was to start an emperor of chocolate manufacturing. And really, it was the first factory in Jordan that produces real chocolate. And I was exporting 60% of my production. And my capacity was four tons per day. When I started, I had no mentor. I didn't have the internet to take information and to, get, uh, to grasp uh, uh, whatever I need to start a successful business. So I decided after succeeding in my business and being number one in Jordan, that I need to give back to my country. I found out that in my factory, where it's situated in the Eastern Amman, where it's the, the, the economy is less and the, 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 the population uh, uh, they are not educated. I found out that really I need to help these women. If we, I started looking at why we have the lowest participation of women in the economy in the region. Jordan has the lowest. Even Saudi Arabia, they have uh, more women in the economy. 
And then I said, really, I want to give back to my country. So I started saying, how can I help women to be more active in the economy? So I found out that really I am tackling different sectors of women. Women in the government, where it's uh, the micro women that uh, their aspirations, their needs are different than the women in, inside of the capital of Amman. So I started going outside of Amman to mentor these women to see what they need. Do they want to start their business? Do they want, want to be employed? What they want? So here was a dilemma, really. Uh, they don't know what they want. And if they want to start a business, I, they need to take the approval of their male uh, brother, father, husband. So we said we want to change this mindset. We want them to leave their comfort zone. We want to create women that they believe in themselves, that you can do it. I didn't come from Moon. Actually, I come from a middle class family where I believe my parents believe in education, education, then education. So I wanted to transfer my experience to these women outside of Amman. So we found out that their challenges, their needs are totally different, uh, the needs inside of Amman. Their challenges were, okay, you want me to work? I have issues in transportation. I ha have issues in mobility. I have issues in child care. I have issues in, in, in my brother or my husband to allow me to leave home. And then we found out that really they don't know their rights. So if, for instance, they came back to us that really they are working more hours. They don't have daycare. So all these issues, we try to see how can we help these women outside of Amman. So we said that uh, 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 we divided them. Some of them, we, have, we had a, a, a session with them, what you want. Some of them we found out that really they want to be employed. But we found that there was some of the women, they had the sparkle in their eyes that they want to start their business, but they don't have neither the skills nor the know-how or how to start from where to start. So we took these women, we tried to see what are the, what the way they want to start a business. So we, we let them find that really, if you want to start a business, find what is missing in your area and then let's fill the gap in this area. So this, this is a one sector of the world that we feel that we are mentoring and coaching and helping them. But also in Amman, where a woman that she, is a, uh, 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 that she graduated from university, and she doesn't know where to go, either to go to, to start a business or to be employed. So we will take these women and see if you want to be employed, but we'll give you entrepreneurship training that you will have the skills to be a competent employee. If you want to be a, an employee, okay, uh, uh, it's up to you, but we will give you the right skills to be really a competent, not a mediocre employee to have the right skills to stay in the business. So basically, uh, uh, this is my passion to help these women because I didn't have the help when I started my business. And then being active in the civil society, in the Young Entrepreneurs Association, in, in Jazz, in, which is a junior affiliate uh, 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 achievement. So we go to school to help these students feel what they want to do. Try to see that at, that at the end of the road, uh, there is hope. They can do it. I did it without the money. Don't tell me that I had the money. I didn't have the money. When I got married, we didn't have the money to go for our honeymoon. So I wanted them to relate that I come from your social arena. So it's not that only the, the rich people can, uh, can succeed. So this is part of my passion. And just I want, uh, before the end, uh, 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 what, in my opinion, what needs to be done to increase the participation of women and to keep them in the labor force. We should find ways about the valuable role women can play in mainstream economic activity. We should review existing programs and funds that provide access to financing. Access the status of business development support. Provide recommendations about the state of access to finance for women entrepreneurs. Identify where gaps in access exist. Financial institutions should have loan staff that understand the opportunities. Access to training, mentoring, and coaching. Access to role models and how to make them more visible. 
because really they are not visible. The media should be one of the main pillars if we want to enhance the participation of women in the economy. We should change the mindset of the male counterpart, which is the most important. If the male counterpart are really, they, we cannot change their mindset, nothing will happen. I will give you a story in my factory where one of the males wanted to, uh, to marry one of the females in the factory, one of the workers. I told him, you want to keep her working? He said, no, of course not. I said, why? He said, not because I don't want, but the neighbors, the family, what they will say. So this issue, if we can create, change the mindset of the male counterpart, it will be a really an asset for us for the participation of women. And what I recommend, wealth and social justice. Creative idea, the time is now. Create solution to the most pressing problems. We should not accept the status quo. Need to take action. Increase number of change makers expanding in knowledge-driven sectors, not concentrated in traditionally female sectors, which has low value added and low employability and growth. Access to markets, economic diversifications, building network, business partnership and trade linkages, awareness about existing resources and capacity building, building tools, franchising and web-based entrepreneurship. Final word. I believe it was Martin Luther King Jr. who said, excellence is to the best antidote for racism. I think the same is true for chauvinism. So let's all go out and be excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Nina. <coughs> Thank you, Nina. Nina's story is also important because she's been able to bridge the gap to policy making and sits on a number of, of very important advisory boards in Jordan. And I think in that we have been able to make some leverage. Uh, Muna, a lot of discussion in this meeting has been about the socialization processes that define boys and girls differently and, and hold different expectations when they pursue educations and careers. And, and these barriers obviously are created early in life and are then reinforced in the media. Um, you have spoken uh, as a public media personality and written about these issues extensively. Um, your view. Uh, thank you so much for inviting. Is my uh, voice uh, heard? Yeah. Okay. Good. Ali Shui? Please? Sure. Um, just a sec. I'm also freezing. So, you know, I come from a desert country uh, where basically this would be considered Antarctica. And, and so please forgive me if my um, teeth chatter a little bit while I'm talking. Um, one of my favorite sayings that I heard the founder of the White House Project um, say on YouTube was, you can't be what you can't see. And it's very important to realize how the role of media works in this. So, for example, I believe that there is a big danger that the story of women that come out of my part of the world has become a single version. with a little bit of variance, a little bit of local culture, Marrakesh here, I'm not there. But there's this idea of women that are helpless, that are um, marginalized, and they exist, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but it becomes the overwhelming narrative that defines women from the Arab world. An example, for the past two days, I've been in this um, conference, which, you know, a lot of you are experts, decision makers, and people who participate in the civil society sector that impacts uh, my country. And every single time, Saudi Arabia was mentioned. It was mentioned in a very negative manner, except of course by Manal when she spoke during lunch. I was categorized and I was stereotyped. And it was from the people that should know better. And that was quite upsetting. I'm not saying that it doesn't exist. I'm saying that it can't be the story that defines a woman like me. And we go back to what's happening in the media in the Arab world. So for the past few months, there's been a lot of negative reactions to the Arab Spring about what 
is going on in the parliamentary elections, um, the fear of Islamism, and Egypt, of course, is still being determined. But in Libya, 16% of women are in parliament. That's much more than was there before the revolution. Tunisia, 27%, the same number as before the revolution. Morocco, there are gains. Algeria, there were gains. These are positive stories that need to be told. They could be better. But it's not the doomsday that we keep on hearing in the media. If I go back into what's going on in Saudi Arabia, in Kuwait, in Bahrain, about gender, there's a huge complex problem that occurs is that the reference point that we talk about is quite different. I keep hearing the word equality, musawa in Arabic. That's not the word that people use to describe human rights. They talk about the camel, complementary. It's an issue for some people, but that's the word that's being used. So when we don't even use the same words, we can't reach the same um, conclusion. We need to kind of um, bring ourselves to accept other people's definitions of what they believe is right for them. Another thing that um, occurs is that there's not enough investment in actual training for leaders, not just female leaders, but also male leaders, young leaders, older leaders, retraining of government leaders into what kind of world we want to see. There's a very beautiful um, question that I was asked when I was in the Aspen Institute. I said, what is the good life? What is the definition of the good life? We don't know what the definition of the good life is in the Arab world. So until we can actually work together, whether through Congresses, like it was mentioned today earlier, or through um, media conversations to define what does it mean, the good life for Arab people, then we can't actually get real conclusions. We can't actually get steps. What we will get is exactly what we're getting today. Different people with different agendas, fighting each other, always reacting to what's occurring versus actually planning a real future. I'm part of the media, I'm part of the problem. My show isn't though. <laughs> um, softly speaking, NBC is the number one um, show in the Arab world. It's really about how do we bring positive role models to the world. People watch us on YouTube, people watch us in Malaysia. Um, the problem is that, you know, God, um, positive role models um, don't bring a lot of ratings. So you have to spice it up. Um, as I said, we're part of the problem. And this is my commentary on media and the social <laughs> contract. Thank you, Mona. Um, yeah. The social media has been a very big part, and I hope we'll get to that. But, you know, in, in Egypt, they called it the Facebook revolution, and, and we're now looking at the impact of, of that dynamic. But I'd like, we have, I think, about 10 minutes. And if there are any questions and queries from the floor, we'd love to take them now. Sure. I saw a hand there. Shalini Natraj, Global Fund for Women. So I'm glad that one of the points that came up that I think hasn't been discussed enough is the need for infrastructure that will allow women to go out and participate in the workforce or in the public sphere. Lack of daycare, lack of elder care. I mean, I have aging parents, and more and more I have to think about their care. So that impacts my ability to fully participate in the workplace and in things I want to do. And I'm a woman with a lot of privilege. But you look at the women that we are mostly talking about here, and that lack of infrastructure, I think, is something that really needs to be addressed. Lack of good and affordable daycare, lack of access to health care. Um, the Global Fund for Women has grantees in Bangladesh that actually help companies set up creches, daycares, to enable female workers to have their children close by. And they have found that that reduces absenteeism, 
and increases the productivity of the worker because she's not worrying about her children and what's happening to them when she's at work. So I would love to know if you have any um, concrete examples of where this kind of um, infrastructure for women has been put in place. Maybe Lena, you would know of something as you are promoting entrepreneurship. How do women fully participate as entrepreneurs or in the public sphere if they don't have this basic infrastructure? Thank you. Thank you. Let me take a couple of questions. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, I'm Manas Afkami, Women's Learning Partnership. We work with 20 partners, most of them in the MENA region. And uh, I was wondering if the panel would address the urgent situation uh, of, of transitions in the Middle East in the political context, as well as what you've done in economic uh, context. Uh, we know right now that uh, the forces of human rights and inclusion and democracy and tolerance, uh, uh, who were really at the forefront of the uh, Arab Spring struggles are being subdued by the better organized, better funded, internationally from certain quarters supported uh, groups that, uh, as you mentioned, uh, get the vote. And getting the vote, uh, and of course, uh, if we go to the case of Egypt, they haven't even gotten that much of the wo vote if you count what percentage they actually received. But in essence, uh, they're handling uh, the future of the country. Now, democracy, as you mentioned, is not the vote in the uh, ballot box, is a process that has to be learned. It's uh, an experience that has to be gone through. And what is unfortunate is that the other forces have the networks, have the messages, have the money. The secular, young, democratic forces don't still have any of those. And as Democrats in this room, we understand that there's always on this hand and on the other hand, and let's discuss and nuance, while the other forces are clear and very uh, authoritative. So what are the ways? How can we catch up? How can we uh, give a chance to the youth, to the freedom uh, lovers? Uh, how do we uh, bridge this gap in, in possibilities right now in this urgent moment uh, of the Arab Spring? Thank you. Thanks very much. Is there any other uh, comment? OK, I'll take Farida. Opportunity, because I think many of you have in your minds what happened with the Arab Revolution and where women are going after this revolution. Maybe for the first time you might hear this, that in Libya, the sparkle of the revolution started by the mothers of the detainees in the prison. For almost one year, they have been every Saturday demonstrating to know the fate of their sons. And then two days before the revolution, their lawyer was captured and they went to the prison to ask that the lawyer is brought out. And then they were shocked, many people were shocked. And that was the beginning of the Libyan revolution that nobody knows, the media doesn't know. This is number one. Secondly, right after the revolution, the role of women, not only in cooking food and supporting the, uh, the, the, the youth who were in the, in the, in the field, there were many women who were taking arms, taking money, taking messages, the role of the, the political role of the, particularly the young women, particularly the young women. And interestingly enough, another surprise, and that brings us back, that is education alone going really to teach women justice. When I was doing my PhD dissertation in the Libyan desert many, many, many years ago, in the, in the 70s, before I left for, for good, an, an old Bedouin woman told me that she insisted that her son sends his daughter to school because she said, you know, I am dying and I know what's uh, injustice, so I don't want them to be, you know, uh, 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 suffering what I have suffered. So what I want to say now, in this momentum now, in all Arab countries, uh, and we're now connecting in Tunisia, in Yemen, in everywhere, 
it's not easy to describe the momentum, the energy, the enthusiasm, and the politicized women, including the illiterate women, the simple women, the rural women. So we, of course, now the challenges are very, very, very sad because despite this big role, and it happened after the Algerian revolution, after the, our revolutions for independence when we were colonized, the story is repeating itself. After all what we have done, now the new politicians, and many of them were in the opposition, many of them were my friends, they were with me in the political parties when we were in the opposition. All of a sudden they changed 180 degrees when it comes to women. So now the position of, for, for, for women in these countries, in Egypt, we need first of all to unite. We need to create a force. Secondly, we cannot give up because it's very dangerous now. If we give up, we are afraid that for the next hundred years, it's going to be very, very dangerous to, you know, move again and to, to gain our rights. Thirdly, there are more and more good men, and I like the comment of our friend from, I think, Australia today, more and more men are supporting women, not just because they want to support women, but they recognize very, very well the intelligence. Now, when you see the statistic, you know, Today in the Arab world, of course, I cannot speak. We are 22 Arab countries, 300 million people, 50% are women, and 50% are you know, of young age. So how we are looking to the future? Nobody can guarantee it because we don't know how it's going to happen. But all I can assure politically, strategically, uh, 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 networking, uh, uh, moving into all fronts. So our agenda today also, we are mainstreaming, we are dividing labor, we are including youth, and we are pushing and mainstreaming our, well, not what, no, we are not waiting now, to be honest with you, I keep saying it everywhere in Libya. I cannot be invited to do this and not to do that because I cannot leave Libya to men alone. So all I can assure you now, there is a positive momentum, lots of energy. Mm -hmm. The international community, their intervention must be intelligent, strategic. And I like this uh, foundation yesterday when he was talking about focusing two, three, four years and being patient. We don't want the hit and run, the one meeting, the one training, the one conference. This is not going to lead too much to, uh, to what we are <coughs> Thank you. For. Thank so, you, Farida. I can't resist the Prime Minister of Yemen, Mr. al Iriani, who is leading a remarkably important process in his own country now. Thank you very much. As a follow-up to uh, Dr. Farida, I would like to say that Yemen is one of the least developed country in the Arab world. And yet, women were the vanguard in the Arab Spring of Yemen, which led eventually to a peaceful transfer of power president was changed, new president was elected, and women fought very hard. They led the demonstrations. They more or less exposed their life to extreme dangers, but eventually they succeeded. And the best news that has come to Yemen and from Yemen is that the Nobel Peace Prize winner is a Yemeni. Mm -hmm. And that is a reward for her and all Yemeni women who really fought hard to effect the final uh, change. The role of women, I think, by this revolution has changed forever. Mm. Right now, we are preparing for the national dialogue. The number of women who will be there, no less than 30%. A 500 dialogue means there will be 150 Yemeni women charting the new future of Yemen with a new constitution, with a new governance system, with more justice and equality. And I think if I had a hat, I would raise it for Yemeni women. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah Yemeni. We, we have to start to wrap up. So let me just, I'm going to make two comments and then hand back um, to my colleagues. For the first uh, speaker from the floor, you would have been heartened by the discussion in the work-life 
uh, family balance discussion this morning. A, a lot on that, but I think we will continue to learn from each other. And for the second speaker, definitely political and economic rights have to go hand in hand, so we're not talking about one side. We have been learning from Europe. Um, the political transformations of Greece and Portugal and Spain in the 1970s does not prevent those countries from collapsing economically very recently. And similarly, the liberal transformations of the private sector in the Arab world did not ensure democratic processes or any kind of inclusion and fairness. So I think we're talking about complementarity of the highest order. So let me go again from Lina uh, down. I, I will, uh, you know, the statistics about the, 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 the participation of women in the economy, sometimes it's uh, not enough. For this reason, for this reason, we are undercounted when the governments want to, uh, to start uh, discussing any uh, issue in this country, uh, public policy. So what we try to do now, we are lobbying as, as civil society and private sector for different issues. One of them is called small office, home office, where we are created that women can start her business from home without getting or needing the licensing, the right, the licensing to start the business from uh, uh, from uh, ordinary office. And then uh, uh, we are lobbying also to have laws with the labor, with the labor law about the part-time job. Flexible timing that she can, the, the woman can come anytime, uh, uh, not to come from a certain amount, at, from eight till uh, four or five. And then uh, the law of uh, the, the, to have a, day, a daycare, the law previously was if in this company we have 20 employees, 20 female employees, now I think it will be changed if we have 20 females and male employees that it's a obligatory to have a, a daycare. Plus, uh, uh, we are trying to lobby to have incentives for the banks. If their portfolio of, uh, uh, of customers are females, then we will, the, the, the central bank will give them incentives for uh, uh, to help women start their businesses uh, to have access to finance and the other thing is we are also lobbying <coughs> the government for the government pro procurement to have a certain percent to buy from women owned businesses if we will succeed with this really and of course the the, the umbrella is the quota for the board of directors in, in in the economy if we will succeed in this definitely if we are number 125 in the gender gap index from 135, I hope within years we will have uh, a better situation. Thank, Thank you, Lina Rahma. Two minutes. Yes, uh, just uh, <laughs> um, um, I want to add uh, something. Firstly, um, yeah, uh, Egypt experienced that within the uh, 13, um, with 30 years of Mubarak regime, um, the um, uh, amounts, the um, amounts of financial um, flows that uh, uh, enter Egypt are a huge amounts. It's the unbelievable con con comparing to other Arab countries. But what is the result? It's very bad result. It's, uh, um, and therefore, I what I mean that it's uh, uh, economically we cannot just. Um, and look at um, economical reform um, out of uh, discussing the issue of uh, rational governance and uh, democ real democracy and transparency. We are um, um, one month, maybe um, le less than two months ago, we met the IMF delegation when they visit Egypt to discuss the issue of the new uh, fund, new um, and we ask them, we discuss with them that lack of transparency, that the Egyptian people didn't know anything about this condition, this con the condition of the, and the dialogue should be declared. And this is one of the Egyptian people an issue concerning the revolution. And that this uh, government has enough credibility. But they ignore our, I, I mean that home, some of non-governmental organizations, civil society organization, independent trade union who met the delegation, but they ignore our remarks. And of course they now 
realized that that's a, a very um, big problem concerning this uh, authority credibility concerning the Egyptian uh, uh, the Egyptian people as a whole. I think that some some and within the international community, it's uh, we are that credibility should not be out of the issue of social dialogue, social dialogue uh, that um, and its tools, organizations that can uh, organize social dialogue, um, um, council, uh, which is free and independent, not controlled by the authority. Um, and then um, I think it can be, we can uh, talk about it, um, um, economical empowerment of different social parts and social dialogue that can lead to um, balanced society and stable society. Thanks, Sahma. One of final words. Um, so when I was heading the foundation, Al-Walid bin Talal Foundation, for eight years, we looked at uh, girls' enrollment. We worked very hard on increasing um, uh, you know, literacy between women. We looked at the participation of women in the workforce, addressing uh, some of the questions that were asked today about um, daycare, and it is a problem. We looked at the representation of women in national parliaments, whether they were official, like in uh, MENA, or uh, unofficial, like Majlis Ashura in, in Saudi Arabia. So these are things that I've worked on for a very long time. And yet, Somehow, the minute a regime changes, it seems like everything erodes. And that's why it's so important to tie these things into a larger, specific cultural narrative that is perpetuated by informal education, by formal education, but most importantly, by all the forms of media that people consume, whether it's through mobile phones, internet, or TV, um, and of course I'm advertising for TV since I'm on TV. Um, but this is very important. The gains have to be translated into something that um, can be easily referenced and becomes part of the identity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mona. Thank you all for listening and thank you for being patient. I think civil society, the media and the private sector in the Arab world, this will be a long journey. Thank you very much. And to my ladies.